good morning and um, welcome to day two of the Life in Kyrgyzstan conference. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Katrina Kosek. If you haven't read one of the many and insightful papers that uh, Katrina writes so prolifically, and I strongly recommend you do, um, then let me read you her Twitter profile uh, by way of a very brief introduction to who she is. Senior Research Fellow at IFPRI, lecturer at Johns Hopkins, tweeting about public finance, governance, gender, migration, and political behavior. Now, if you find that description a bit too short, then you may also like to know that Katrina works in the Development, Strategy, and Governance Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI in Washington, D.C., where she is the theme leader for public investment. Katrina received her PhD in political economics and her MA in economics from Stanford University. But what I really like about her profile is that uh, she hasn't uh, only worked in a or sort of studied in a pure econ context because your first degree is in international political economy from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. So the international dimension um, comes through there. Katrina's research focuses on how institutions and policies shape people's lives, livelihoods, and their well-being, which is a research agenda which is very close to my heart too. She has extensive field experience and data collection um, experience in many countries, including relevant today, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Pakistan. Katrina is a prolific author, as I said. Her work has been published in leading journals, including the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Development Economics, Nature Climate Change, the Journal of Health Economics, Economic Development, Cultural Change, World Development, and actually many other very good journals, um, too numerous to list. In fact, if you look at her Google Scholar profile, the publication entries for the years 2022 and 2021 don't even fit on the front page of the Google Scholar page. So you have to scroll down to the next page to see all those entries for those years alone. And if that isn't enough of a fun fact for you to know about Katrina, then how about the title of her first ever publication in a journal article? Do you remember, Katrina? Yeah. Which was called The Effects of Ownership and Benchmark Competition on U.S. Water System Regulatory Compliance and Household Water Expenditure. So do you know what I mean about her having a multidisciplinary interest to the life on Earth and uh, the world around us? So I think that's very cool. Um, we have um, a great scholar with us today, um, very productive and, and curious scholar. And uh, I really always enjoy meeting Katrina. I'm sorry you can't be here today in person, but we're very glad you agreed to join us um, remotely. Um, so thank you for joining us, Katrina. A very warm welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Tillman. I'll pull up my slides here. All right. Can everyone see those? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the introduction, Tillman. The pleasure is always likewise when we encounter in an airport or, port or else where I've seen you at many conferences. Um, I'm delighted to be delivering the, uh, the conference uh, day two keynote address. And the title of my talk is The Effects of Income Shocks on Rural Livelihoods. So just to start out, why do we care about shocks to household income? Well, these, type, these shocks are growing in policy relevance because they're becoming increasingly frequent and increasingly a large strain on governments. They have a, a, a growing severity. We've seen these a lot in the news lately. They are due to climate change or violence or shocks like COVID-19 and the Ukraine-Russia war. These result in rising prices. And with these rising prices, you see a declining purchasing power amongst households and then overall reductions in household welfare measured in a variety of ways. But at the same time, knowing the likely impacts and how these impacts vary across different types of people and different types of households can really inform effective policy responses that address the root causes of some of these uh, problems and address the right groups, those that are really suffering in a particular dimension. So the plan of the talk for today, I'm going to consider how different types of shocks affect household and individual welfare. And I'm just going to take two case studies. Um, there are multiple studies for each of these cases, but they are Kyrgyzstan and Pakistan. In the case of Kyrgyzstan, we're considering how price shocks that have resulted in, in changes in income have impacted labor de supply decisions and migration, as well as how they've affected health and well-being outcomes. And then in Pakistan, we're going to look at how 
climate, climatic events, heat stress and floods in particular, how do these impact migration outcomes? And how do they impact individuals' aspirations or goals for the future? And then we'll discuss briefly the policy lessons that emerge from these two cases. And maybe we can take away something about how policy needs to respond to these growing, uh, frequently, uh, growingly frequent shocks. So the first case study here from Kyrgyzstan, um, this is forthcoming in feminist economics right now, and it's joint work with my colleagues Ji Song from University of California, Berkeley, Hong Di Xiao from Cornell University, and Brian Holtemeyer, my colleague at IFPRI. It's titled The Gendered Impacts of Income Fluctuations on Household Departure, Labor Supply, and Human Capital Decisions, Evidence from Kyrgyzstan. And the research question we examine here is, how do income shocks affect labor supply decisions? And how do their effects differ by gender? And we look at a variety of different outcomes. We want to understand the, the, the array of different impacts that these shocks have. So we look at household departure, which is basically how we're trying to capture migration. When an individual is leaving the household and we try to home in on leaving the household for reasons other than death, um, how does that uh, uh, correlate with shocks to income? We also look at employment and hours of labor supplied at the origin, some patterns related to temporary migration, both internally and internationally, as well as human capital accumulation. And to give you a preview of the results, in this paper, we're analyzing uh, a 13-year rolling panel in Kyrgyzstan that spans 2004 to 2016. That's, those are the data which we use. Um, this is the Kyrgyzstan Integrated Household Survey data and we put the various rounds together. Now, we know that income shocks are endogenous to some of the other outcomes I just mentioned to you, and we address those uh, using techniques um, uh, from Bartik 1991, um, an instrumental variable strategy that's commonly used in the labor literature, and I'll detail that a bit more going forward. But what we find is that reductions in income relative to sort of the median income that a household has result in migration, household uh, individuals departing the household. Um, both men and women are, 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 are made to migrate in response to negative shocks to income, but the impacts are significantly larger for men. At the same time, we see that women's labor supply at the origin in the, in the original household is affected significantly more than that of men. And women are experiencing short-term increases in employment and, and declines in time on home production and other activities, including leisure, unpaid domestic work um, in response to. So women are absorbing a lot of the need to generate income at home, whereas men are more likely to, uh, to go abroad or, or internally migrate in order to generate income. These reductions um, in, in income are not, again, not only spurring uh, permanent migration, but also temporary migration for both genders. And really importantly, we find that reductions in income tend to widen the gender gap in pursuit of non-compulsory education in a way that favors men. I'll show you what I mean by that later, but non-compulsory education here, we're focusing on those ages aged 15 to 25 who are making conscious decisions about whether or not to pursue more education. So what is the motivation here? And really what this comes down to is the fact that income fluctuations are ubiquitous in low-income countries. And we know that they also substantially negatively affect the poor. And part of the reason why is that poor households tend to underinsure against such shocks. But at the same time, the impacts on migration are not exactly clear theoretically, because on the one hand, migration can be sort of a form of self-insurance. You migrate in response to a shock in order to make up for the lost income due to the shock. But at the same time, households that migrate need to finance that migration, which is difficult when income in the household has declined. And especially if you look at shocks that might have caused some sort of a disaster that, that destroyed parts of the household, sometimes those shocks can actually retain members of the household because they need to repair or deal with some of these negative consequences. It's on how income shocks affect migration or employment and investments in human capital and very little in the way of how women and men might be differentially impacted, which is unfortunate because there are so many ways that, that we could think of different impacts on men versus women. M women and men have very different levels of mobility. They um, have different levels of integration into formal labor markets. 
uh, different education and types of work performed, and different perceived returns to education, which might impact and moderate the effects of shocks. And we'll examine that formally. So a background, this is one crowd, I don't think I need to give too much background on Kyrgyzstan for, but we're looking at a landlocked low-income country until the period during the period which we're studying. Kyrgyzstan was still low-income country. It has since moved up um, during the end of our period of study in Central Asia. We're looking at a 2004 GDP per capita of about 757 constant 2010 dollars, and this modestly increases over the study period to about 1,042 dollars by 2016. There's a little slide over time in employment and agriculture. It's 39% in 2004 at the start of our sample period, and it, it declines to 27% by 2016. There are high rates of migration, um, given some of these poverty statistics, and as much as 15% of the population is estimated to be working abroad. Internal migration is also common, and in our sample, 18% of individuals are born in another community. So we see these types of, uh, of movements within the country. So as I mentioned earlier, we use the Kyrgyzstan Integrated Household Survey. We're using 13 rounds of data. Um, more is coming out, of course. And this is a rolling panel data set for those who have not used these microdata. Uh, the median household during the years we consider is in the sample for about four years. And our sample is comprised of 165,000 approximately individuals from just about 15,000 households. Uh, our outcome variables are household departure, and here we're trying to capture migration. Um, it's a dummy variable for exiting the household roster and, then, and thus ceasing to be considered a household member. Employment is the share of the year that one is employed and also measured as hours during the last week that an individual was, with, was in one of three categories. How many hours were you employed? How many were you dedicating your time to home production? And a third category, everything else. So this is going to capture this third category that, that is present in the survey will capture leisure, sleep, as well as unpaid domestic work. And then temporary migration is a dummy variable for the main place of work at some point during the year being outside of the oblast or, or region, but still inside the country, that's one variable, or being outside of the country. So you have three places of work. You're either working within your oblast, working in another oblast of Kyrgyzstan, or working abroad uh, temporarily. These are not mutually exclusive categories. You can both uh, temporarily migrate ab abroad for some period of time and temporarily migrate internally at some point. But we capture each of these types of internal movements or, or uh, uh, movements abroad. And then human capital acquisition is a dummy variable for being a student at some point during the year. And again, we will focus on 15 to 25 year olds here. So beyond the age of compulsory schooling. So our econometric specification here, what we're trying to predict is household departure, employment or education outcomes. This is the letter D here on the left hand side. And we're trying to understand how that is impacted by fluctuations in income in the household. And in particular, we define a household's median income as what's somewhat typical for that household. And we observe how high above the median or below the median for that specific household a household's income is in a given year. So we're seeing fluctuations around the median for a given household in a model that has household fixed effects, which has year fixed effects. And we're trying to see if the timing of fluctuations in income happens to correlate with timing of departure from the household, changes in labor force patterns, change in, changes in education outcomes, et cetera. Um, we are interacting these shocks with gender because we want to specifically and statistically test whether these impacts have different impacts on women versus men. We can observe whether the point estimates are distinct and different from one another, but we wanna statistically compare them as well and see if those differences are, are significant. So to give you a sense of this distribution of shocks experienced, um, for, an, for a household that is receiving a positive shock in, in, a, in a given year, on average, they're experiencing income that's about 28.2% above the median. And for a household experiencing that's experiencing a negative shock, it's about on average about 21% less than the median. So you can see that these fluctuations in income are common. Households are not relying on the same amount of income each year, but rather have a very uh, changing uh, amount coming into the household each year. So our identification strategy, I admit, I, I mentioned that we're using a BARTIC uh, 1991 instrument 
Our problem here is omitted variable bias as well as reverse causality. And there's a nice solution in this literature of computing the predicted income um, that a household has. And how do we predict this? Well, we cannot use endogenous information to predict it, or we will get a similarly endogenous variable. So we wanna take information that couldn't possibly be influenced by the household itself and comes from outside. And what do we do? Well, we look at this, the ways household, households earn income in, in this survey. And there are nine different sources of income. And we look at the share of income for a household that comes from each of these sources. And then we look at shifts or changes nationwide over time in income from these sectors. So if we look at a particular sector in which a household might be earning, earning income, um, we could look at um, non-farm wage income, for example, how, how are the patterns of income changing amongst other households in Kyrgyzstan and not that particular household? So we emit the household and we compute a national average. And then we use those national average. Yeah. Sorry if I interrupt you. Types of and the interpreters are asking whether you could please oh, what's that tell a little me? slower so that the interpreters um, can catch up with your speaking. Would that be okay, please? Oh, certainly, certainly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tell me when to resume. Yeah, please resume. If you can just speak a little slower, please, then we'll do. The interpreters. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Perfect. So we are computing predicted income using a household's initial period income shares from nine different sources, and then nationwide changes over time in income from those particular sources. And this gives us a predicted measure of household income. It exploits that part of household income that is due to exogenous shifts in returns to economic activity in a given sector. So this slide is showing you our first stage results. And basically what you should take away from this slide is that predicted changes in income are, are very good at predicting actual household income. We have first stage F statistics that are above 500 and this is, is common with a BARTIC instrument. Now turning to the results, we look at three different lags of income. Panel A is showing a one-year lag, panel B a two-year lag, and panel C a three-year lag of income. And we show specifications with individual controls as well as without individual controls in columns one and column two. And you can see that the results do not change much depending on whether controls are used. What emerges is that departure from the household is indeed uh, caused by these income shocks. And in particular, we see that for men, the point estimates are, are, are always larger. There's a, when you have a negative shock to income, you have an increase in this type of migration for men and a smaller one for women, but it's still present at least in the short term for women. For men, these effects are persistent even three years out, men are more likely to, to be leaving the household uh, compared to women. Turning to employment, we see patterns where the effects seem to be stemming in fact from women. When we look at the effect of a shock on the share of the year employed, hours of employment, hours of home production, and hours of other activities. Remember, this is sleep, this is domestic work, this is um, anything other than, than employment. We see that when there's a negative shock to women, uh, to, 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 to income, women become more likely to be employed for a greater share of the year. They tend to increase their uh, hours of employment they tend to reduce home production and significantly reduce time spent on, on leisure and other activities. For men, we see, we see effects as well, but the effects are smaller and more muted in the case of men. By a more going a further lag, the effects are only present for women here. With one year of lag, we only see women's labor supply affected. Um, and these are persistent for women um, into later periods. Now, looking at additional employment and human capital accumulation, we see that a negative shock to income makes it less likely that men and women are working multiple jobs. These effects are persistent with different lags of income. Um, we find that 
that the negative shock to income makes both men and women want to work more. And the patterns on human capital accumulation are particularly interesting. We find that what the immediate impact of a shock is, is a, a negative shock leads to a decline in the likelihood of pursuing non-compulsory education for both women and men. And the point estimate is larger. We see a bigger decline in women pursuing education compared to men. But the difference here is not statistically significant. Go one year later, this negative impact on pursuit of non-compulsory education is only present for, for women. There's no impact for men. If anything, men are actually more likely to be, to be pursuing education in this next period, although that is not statistically significant. And the difference between men and women is significant. And then go two years later, and this is the interesting part, no effect on women anymore. So the women have not, uh, are not um, experiencing impacts on their human capital accumulation two years out. But men reverse the trends uh, we found earlier. They become more likely, they're making up for the fact that they were not pursuing human capital earlier and they're going back to school whereas we do not see that pattern for women. So women have this drop off from education that seems to be more of a permanent uh, impact on their education. Whereas from, as for men, they're almost making up completely for the decline uh, in pursuit of non-compulsory education we saw immediately with the shock. So we see this widening gender gap in pursuit of human capital in response uh, to this negative shock to income. Temporary migration, while we find that temporary migration also is becomes more likely with a negative shock to income. Um, but these, these impacts, again, are statistically significantly greater for men compared to women. Um, and uh, we find that it is not actually temporary migration to other countries, but rather within Kyrgyzstan that is, that are, is happening in response to the shock. So in conclusion, reductions in income relative to the median result in household departure, uh, household departure, but there are bigger impacts on men compared to women. Women are compensating with more, more labor at the origin. And reductions in income also fuel temporary migration for both genders with larger effects for men. Reductions in income widen the gender gap in pursuit of non-compulsory education in a way that favors men. Now we're going to the next paper here. Again, this is still in Kyrgyzstan, uh, but this is considering a different outcome. The paper is titled The Effects of Income Fluctuations on Undernutrition and Overnutrition Across the Life Cycle. And this is joint work with Ji Sung from University of California, Berkeley. It was published in 2020 in Health Economics. And the research question examined is, how do household income fluctuations in Kyrgyzstan affect health and nutrition outcomes and how do these effects vary by gender and across the life cycle? To give you a preview of the results, we find that declines in household income reduce the weight of children, their weight, their weight for age Z score, and their weight for height Z score for children under five. Weights and heights of older children ages five to 18 also are reduced. These negative shocks to income result in declines in, in health and nutrition that are most pronounced among highly agriculture dependent households and among rural households. But there is something good that seems to come from these shocks in that adults experience lower BMI body mass index and reduced incidence of overweight and obesity. And we'll consider several possible causal mechanisms as well. Our motivation here is the fact that the poor have a higher arrival rate of shocks, they underinsure, and because they have an inability to smooth consumption in a way that actually is known to disproportionately affect women, it's possible that their health is declining in response to a shock. There are known to be strong correlations between income and health. Challenge of causality, um, which has led many to consider the effects of extreme events. They examine the effects of large droughts or prolonged blackouts, wars and conflicts or recessions and financial crises. Or they consider the effects of targeted cash transfer programs. But these are different from the common everyday shocks that an individual might experience. Um, 
Also, um, findings from cash transfer programs tend to give you great evidence about individuals who are eligible for cash transfer programs, but they tell you a lot less about individuals who are far from the, the eligibility cutoff for a cash transfer program. And so this raises again the important question, what are the health impacts of more commonly experienced modest fluctuations in income? And how do these vary by gender and across the life cycle? These results show that in response to a decline in household income, children under age five experience lower weight, lower weight for age, and lower weight for height. So we have statistically significant impacts here. We do not find that these differ though, but for boys versus girls, which is encouraging. When we look at older children, ages five to 18, we see declines in weight and height as well. Turning to youth, those aged 18 to 35, we see no effects on height. This is as expected, and it's a nice placebo analysis. We would not expect adult heights to change in response to an income shock. But we see declines in weight, the incidence of overweight, as well as the incidence of obesity. And these positive effects on obesity, sort of seeing declines in obesity from a negative shock persist when we look at income with a two-year lag as well. So this seems to be an important impact on obesity declining. Looking at those over age 35, the impacts are restricted only to the likelihood of being overweight. But again, a negative shock to income reduces the incidence of overweight. So what explains these impacts? Well, we look at several results, please check out the paper but we find that declines in household income tend to reduce consumption of healthy foods and dietary diversity. They tend to reduce the amount of time parents spend with children. And we know that time spent with children is good for their health. So we see declines in this time spent with children, which might come from what we saw in the other paper, which is women tending to work more in response to a shock. We do, however, see increased use of contraception and this is possibly offsetting some of the negative impacts of shocks on existing children because parents are, are not dividing their resources between a new child and existing children. But we find no changes in healthcare expenditures. So in conclusion, we see declines in young children's weight, but we see improvements in health for adults in the form of lower obesity and overweight. And again, these results seem to be due to changes in consumption patterns and parental time use. Now turning to the next case study, we turn to Pakistan here and we'll look at two papers. The first is titled Heat Stress Increases Long-Term Human Migration in Rural Pakistan. This is joint with my colleagues Valerie Mueller and Clark Gray and it was published in 2014 in Nature Climate Change. The research question considered is, which weather patterns explain the long-term mobility patterns of men and women in Pakistan? And we use um, a few data sources here. During 1986 to 1991, the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, collected data from three provinces in Pakistan. We took all of the individuals that were last surveyed in the final round of this survey, all individuals present in the 1991 round, and we tracked them. We didn't track their households, we tracked every single individual. These individuals come from 583 origin households across 37 villages. And we get control variables from 1991. Then in 2001 and 2012, if pre, did tracking surveys. Um, these data allow us to see where individuals are in the world and when they left their household uh, since, um, since the 1991 round. We create a person year data set over 20, a 21 year period. Um, individuals enter the data set when they turn 15 and they leave when they turn 40 or when they migrate. We're checking for these moments of migration, the timing of migration and how it accords with weather patterns. We have 44,791 person years in this data set. These results show us what is driving in village and out of village migration 
um, how do weather patterns uh, affect this? And what you should learn from this slide is that rainfall doesn't matter as much as temperature. And we show this in three different ways. You can see in specification A, all of our stars here are coming on temperature. Very little, very little um, in the way of stars for rainfall. So it seems to be temperature that is driving uh, moves. We look for interaction effects in specification B. Is there some sort of interaction between temperature and rainfall? And there seems to be very, very small uh, interaction effects, but the, the, the largest impacts are coming from temperature. Specification C is our preferred specification. It examines the impacts of extreme rainfall and extreme temperature. We look at the first quartile and the fourth quartile. So very light rainfall, very heavy rainfall, and very light low temperatures and very high temperatures. And we find that it is these very high temperatures that seem to be driving migration. And they're particularly driving out of village migration. So long-term, long-distance human migration in response to extremes of temperature. This displays this graphically. And what you see is that only in the fourth quartile of temperature are we seeing large impacts um, of, of an increased probability of migrating. And the impacts are largest when you simultaneously have very low rainfall. So low rainfall, high temperature is, is where we're seeing these 12 percentage point jumps and five percentage point jumps in migration as a result of the shock. Um, of these normalized shocks. And, and when you look at the typical, in the middle of the graphic here, the typical scenario of normal rainfall, normal temperature, you're seeing very low rates of migration. So the migration is being spurred by these extremes of high temperature, low rainfall. And then we explored, how, well, how, how are these weather shocks affecting income? And we find that we have declines in both farm and non-farm income, very little impacts on farm wage income, but big impacts on net farm income and non-farm income. They are declining in response to extremes of temperature. Our next study here is also from Pakistan, and this is considering the impacts of floods. Uh, the paper is titled Aspirations and the Role of Social Protection, Evidence from a Natural Disaster in Pakistan. And this is joint work with Cecilia Mo of University of California, Berkeley. It was published in World Development in 2017. So you may be wondering what are aspirations and aspirations can be understood as the degree or quality of performance which an individual desires to attain or feels that he or she can attain. Aspiration levels can be low or high and they're influenced by external factors like government policies or economic shocks as we show in this paper. Um, they can be influenced by the set of individuals to whom one is exposed. Someone, if your friends are achieving a lot, you may set higher goals for yourself. They're influenced by internal features and cognitive traits as well. How in control of your life do you feel? How trusting are you? How much self-esteem do you have? What is your degree of risk aversion? These can influence the goals that you set for yourself. The research questions we examine are, how do natural disasters affect citizens' aspirations for the future? And can government's social protection policies successfully mitigate any damaging effects? This is motivated by a growing literature that is recognizing the importance of aspirations in determining whether individuals make investments that can move them out of poverty. However, little is known about the factors which contribute to aspirations formation. What causes people to be ambitious and have high goals for themselves? No literature that we knew of at the time of this paper's publication examines the impacts of negative shocks like natural disasters on aspirations, nor whether government social protection can help mitigate negative effects. We look at Pakistan's July through August 2010 monsoon season floods, which offer a natural experiment to examine the aspirational effects of shocks and of government responses. This is very relevant now as well, seeing what is in the news in Pakistan right now with uh, even larger floods occurring um, this season. 
To preview the results, higher aspirations predict several future-oriented economic and political behaviors. This is why we care about aspirations. They result in having high aspirations tends to lead to greater and more diverse economic investments, and it also results in more political participation, greater voting, membership in political or civic organizations, as well as political knowledge. We look at the impacts of Pakistan's floods 1.5 years after they happened. So sort of medium term impacts of the floods, not immediately after they hit. We find that the negative impacts of the floods on aspirations were, were present. Aspirations declined significantly amongst the most flood affected households. But these declines were reduced almost to zero in villages that received the citizens damage compensation or Watton card program. This suggests a critically important role for social protection policies in mitigating the negative aspirational impacts of these types of shocks. This graphic shows our study context. Study villages are shown in black dots. The shading shows you the extent of flood effectiveness of the various districts. Moderately affected districts are shown in light blue. And this aqua or dark blue color is severely affected districts. So you can see variation in how flood affected districts were. We measure aspirations using a common metric used in the literature. Um, and this asks individuals, what is the level of income you would like to achieve? And then it asks the same question about assets, education level, and social status. And we wanna combine this, this information. So what we do is we uh, first normalize each of these using the average level in an individual's district. And then we compute a weighted sum of the four components with the weight equal to the share of 20 beans that an individual places on that dimension. We want every individual to tell us how important each of these dimensions is to them. And then we wanna combine that information to tell us the aspirations of the individual. This is what it looks like mathematically. We are taking the aspired outcome for an individual we are subtracting the average in their district, and we're dividing by the standard deviation in their district. This tells us how many standard deviations above the, mean, the, the district mean an individual aspires to achieve. And we weight this according to how important the category was to that specific individual. This graphic shows you the share of beans on average placed on different categories. And you see that about 35% of beans were placed on income. Income is the most important of these categories. But we also find similarly important emphasis placed on education, social status, and income. I mentioned earlier that aspirations matter, and that's what this slide is meant to show you. Having higher aspirations predicts greater household expenditures on seeds per acre. It predicts greater taking out of loans. And these loans seem to be going into operating non-agricultural enterprises because we see greater operation of non-agricultural enterprises as a result of having higher aspirations. We also see more voting, membership in political or civic organizations, and higher scores on a test of political knowledge when individuals have higher aspirations. Now we measure rainfall shocks using standard measures in the literature from Hidalgo et al. and Shang, Burke, and Miguel. Um, we use three different measures. The measure we use does not really matter. Uh, you're going to see similar results for all three of them. These data come from NASA power satellite data that are available um, during uh, our study period. We look at the absolute value of how much rainfall is deviating from the mean, um, from the 30 year village mean and sum that up. We look at squared deviations from the mean and we look at centimeters of rainfall. This is our quite basic specification. An individual's aspiration level A is on the left-hand side. It is measured 1.5 years after the, the rainfall shock. And then we me measure the rainfall shock 
are, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we have agroecological zone fixed effects and a vector of um, controls um, for individuals and their households. Here are the impacts on aspirations. And we see that greater rainfall shocks, no matter how we measure them, tend to reduce individuals' aspirations. This is true whether or not we include demographic controls in the reg regression. But we find that these negative impacts on aspirations are happening to poor, poorer people. Here we're looking at the impacts by quintile of expenditure. And we find that all of the negative impacts are occurring amongst the bottom quintile, the second quintile, and the third quintile of household expenditures. The richest 40% uh, as measured by household expenditure see no negative impacts on their aspirations. We see much smaller point estimates. They are not statistically significant. But the bottom 60% of the distribution of, of, of household expenditures here are seeing very similar uh, declines in households, uh, in uh, aspirations as a result of negative um, shocks. Now in comes the government disaster relief program. The government of Pakistan in 2010 launched the Citizens Damage Compensation or Watan Card program in response to these floods. So what did the program do? It provided flood relief to 1.62 million families among the estimated 20 million impacted by the floods. Payments were, were not small, $213, and they were dispersed using a prepaid debit card called a Watton card. The program was one of the largest post-disaster social safety nets ever implemented. And we exploit information stemming from a discontinuity to causally identify the extent to which social protection can mitigate negative effects of natural disasters on aspirations. So how did we, we find a discontinuity here? Well, the official criterion for a household to receive relief was living in what was considered a heavily affected village. This is defined as a village with at least 50% of houses or crops having been flood affected. You might have had villages with 40% of households affected negatively by the floods, and these would not be considered heavily affect affected villages. And so um, district officials would not get any money to help out those people. Now, at the same time, district government officials ultimately controlled disbursement of the program, and they could redirect funds. One impact evaluation of the program noted that only 43 of 100 eligible households received a Watton card. These Watton cards were being given out where district officials wanted to give them out. But the number of cards a district official got depended not on the number of flood victims. It depended on the number of, of uh, flood victims in villages that were heavily affected, or at least above the 50% threshold of houses and crops having been flood affected. And what did this mean? A district official was very unlucky if every village in their district had 49% of people affected by the floods. They would get zero Watson cards despite many victims. We create an instrumental variable for each village and it is the share of flood victims in other villages, not your village, other villages in the same district that had at least 50% flood effectiveness. So we're seeing basically amongst those that were flood affected, what share got what, what share were, were, were given Watton cards to the district official to give out. That shows you how much, how many Watton cards per affected family the district official had. And we find this is a very strong instrument. When, when district officials had more of their, vic, of their flood victims concentrated in heavily affected villages, they had more Watton cards, um, we, we see greater likelihood of a village getting um, Watton cards. And what we find is that all of the negative impacts of, of floods on aspirations are concentrated in villages that did not end up getting access to the Watton card program. When villages have the program, we see still negative, but much smaller 
and statistically insignificant effects on aspirations. So the conclusions here, aspirations from our data, it, it seems to accord with the existing literature. Having high aspirations can be critical to taking certain future-oriented actions and behaviors. We see empirical evidence of this in both the political and economic domains. But Pakistan's 2010 floods, which placed a fifth of the country underwater, significantly lowered aspirations among rural Pakistanis one and a half years later. And the negative impacts of the floods on aspirations were significantly reduced, almost to zero, in villages that received the Citizens Damage Compensation or Watson Card program. So this suggests a critically important role for social protection policies in mitigating the negative aspirational impacts of shocks like this. So putting the findings from four studies together, what, what, have, we, what have we concluded? Well, economic shocks from income shocks to floods to droughts have powerful impacts on a large and varied set of outcomes. They do not just affect a very narrow set of outcomes. They affect psychological outcomes, um, labor-related outcomes, health and nutrition outcomes. It is a very wide set of outcomes. Negative income shocks spur migration, especially for men. They increase labor hours supplied at the origin, especially for women. And they result in declines in health, especially for young children. Floods, we know, reduce, migra uh, reduce migration, if anything, but heat stress or drought conditions increase it. Floods lower aspirations, which are individually set goals for the future. But really importantly, these impacts are not the same across all households or individuals within a household. We see important differences according to gender, according to age, according to household poverty status, according to urbanization status, dependence on agriculture, and other factors that moderate the impact of an income shock. So this creates a challenge to policymakers to, to think of individuals and households as likely to be differently affected based on pre-existing underlying factors such as these. And it makes for a more complicated policy response in order to address negative impacts. But among this, understanding what are the likely impacts and how they may vary across households and individuals can allow for more appropriate and targeted policies that can avert the greatest negative impact. Thank you so much. That concludes my uh, presentation and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Katrina. That was a really uh, fascinating overview over um, only a few of your papers, but giving a wealth of um, information where probably a little bit data shocked just yeah with all the information uh, you gave but i do think you have some really interesting uh, themes emerging from the different findings and and just to recap it in my own words my big takeaway is that uh, um, shocks are really important um, especially for people um, in poorer countries and poorer settings and poorer villages and and people with fewer you know assets and and more vulnerable livelihoods and these shocks could come from different domains, right? I mean, it could be from climate uh, change, um, weather shocks, it could be uh, floods, it could be um, income shocks, loss of jobs or whatever. So they are, you know, price shocks, et cetera, right? So shocks are uh, very common, but um, they can have uh, long-term impacts and they have long-term impacts and uh, in, a, in a very gendered way. I thought it was um, interesting that you showed in your first paper that shocks are Educate, sorry, the impact of shocks on education were more temporary for men, but they were more permanent for women. Yeah, so that's a, a very concerning um, issue. Yeah, that if women are stopped in their, say, tertiary education um, um, as a result of a shock and permanently so. Yeah, um, or but some some of these shocks that was also interesting in your second paper. You know that they reduce obesity. Now I don't think the policy conclusion can be to have more shocks, right? But uh, uh, to think about um, 
you know, that there is scope for behavioral changes. There is scope for people, uh, you know, having a better nutrition if they experience different contexts. I think one can sort of maybe generalize it like that. Um, I also thought it was interesting. You said um, there was an increased use of um, contraception as a way of protecting existing children, you know, investing in quality as opposed to quantity in a sense, yeah, which is a classic uh, economic theme. And I, I had wondered actually whether um, you'd ever thought to check um, explicitly fertility outcomes um, in response to shocks rather than just the use of um, contraception. On the paper in Pakistan about droughts, I, I just wondered briefly whether um, you also looked at cumulative uh, weather shocks, because um, I know from many settings that it's not just the experience of one large shock, but you know, you households, especially agricultural households, often are driven over time. You know, they use they lose one cow, they lose two cows, and you know, but there's a point where losing the last cow, you know, is what really tips you over um, over the edge. Um, but uh, I also wondered, um, coming to your conclusion, um, whether governments you know, should they just become better at responding to these individual shocks or should they maybe abstract from that and uh, try to find, you know, not just cash transfers like this powerful example you showed in Pakistan, but, uh, you know, this this word I don't really like very much, but resilience, yeah, because it's sort of not really very strict uh, economic term. You know, I prefer thinking in terms of household consumption or income or assets. Um, but what is it that might make people more resilient? Is it just the type of jobs? Is it, you know, opening perhaps opportunities for both men and women to be able to, you know, work, to be able to, um, in fact, accumulate the assets that might you make less vulnerable to shocks? Yeah. So is it the modernization in the sense of the the economy and, and society, which makes people more more resilient? I think it's hard for governments to strengthen resilience because it's such an unclear concept, but uh, but it does seem necessary. Um so, um, you know, how can we move to a more pr proactive and preventive government policies rather than, you know, chasing the very adverse consequences um, when significant shocks materialize? Anyway, it's a very thought provoking uh, um, presentation. And I really thank you for talking us through your results. Um, I wondered if we could, uh, given the time, collect a couple of questions from the audience and then give you a chance to respond. And I hope everybody understands that we may not be able to discuss every comment or every question in in length but perhaps it'd be interesting now to have a different views from the audience uh, questions and comments before giving Katrina a chance to to respond to at least some of those um as you wish if that's okay Katrina yeah so we have mics so that's great would like to ask um a question just raise your hand so we can uh Chris uh wants to kick off Chris, do you, I mean, I can say it in this case, but if maybe generally speaking, people could briefly introduce themselves so Katrina knows who's asking. In this case, it's uh, Chris Gary, the newly appointed Dean of the Graduate School of Development of the University of Central Asia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and thanks, Katrina, for, for a great presentation. Um, and can I just take this opportunity, actually, to thank the translators uh, for the great job they've been doing yesterday and today. I know it's difficult and, and we really appreciate it. Um, uh, just a, a couple of things that come to mind, Katrina, particularly, I guess, around the first presentation. I, I just wonder whether people learn from shocks. I know that you've got this kind of persistence. You, you know, you're checking the persistence of when the shock happened and so on. But is behavior different conditional on previous shocks? I mean, I guess that's another way of asking whether people know they're experiencing shocks, you know, in shock environments. People don't maybe have a sense of what a median income is if they're constantly bouncing around. And then just related to that, if I may, um, what 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 do um, positive income shocks do? You you gave us the results for negative income shocks. Do people how do people respond to to a positive income shock? Do they a, a adopt any kind of insurance like behaviour? And again, is that conditional on having experienced previous negative shocks? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Fantastic questions. Um, it prompts me to ask, uh, maybe to add to that, that you were explaining the context of Kyrgyzstan very briefly, given that this audience doesn't, you know, that point doesn't need much description. But then I was reflecting on the data you gave, Katrina, and I wondered if actually, you know, increasing your national GDP over a period of six, seven years that you gave, you know, by around 30% is actually quite a significant change. And the reduction in the share of employment 
in agriculture, you know, it also was actually quite a rapid reduction. So Kyrgyzstan is actually more an example, whatever the sort of, you know, political fragility sometimes can be, but of a very dynamically evolving and growing and, and structurally transforming economy. I think transition economists would probably say there's a lot of churning, you know, people doing new things and different things. And so um, whether the, perhaps the background of a dynamic economy, including people experiencing positive shocks, that's why I'm saying that now, you know, is is perhaps different from, from economies that, that may well have, you know, flat growth um, over similar periods. Um, but I the, the floor is still open. So if somebody else has a question, um, then feel free to come in. <laughs> Everybody's looking slightly. <laughs> that was a lot of evidence. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chris has a, another question, please. So, so well, if there's no other questions, can I can I just ask whether um, in any of those cases you have evidence on the mental health effects of of shocks? Uh, because I think that's a really important thing in in shock environments. Thanks. Okay, then um, I think that was a lot of points. So why don't you have a why don't we have a first round of answers from you, Katrina, and then um, we can have another round of questions and comments um, after that. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you, uh, Tillman and Chris, for those excellent questions. I will I will go through them and welcome more for others thinking of their questions still. Um, great. So, um, Tillman, starting with yours, your your first question. You you talked about the policy implications of the declines in obesity following negative income shocks, and I would fully agree that uh, we wouldn't have a policy about, um, uh, you know, related to shocks. But I do think that, you know, the reverse of this issue is that as incomes rise, we should expect obesity to rise amongst certain groups. Um, so having policies that can simultaneously acknowledge an environment in which rising incomes are improving young children's health, at the same time that they deteriorate older individuals' health are very important. Those are very different health policies to sort of raise diet, improve diets and, um, and, uh, um, and nutrient consumption amongst younger children um, while reducing overall dietary intake amongst older individuals. So I think there's some policy implications in here, especially when you look at the, the trend of rising incomes we see uh, in many contexts. Um, fertility outcomes explicitly Yes, I have to say the Kyrgyzstan Integrated Household Survey was not the greatest for matching babies with mothers and, and sort of tracking these over a period. We did our best in the paper and please check it out. We found suggestive but not statistically significant impacts on fertility, but it's hard because we only have four years of data per household. And so some of these outcomes, you might just need a longer panel to more seriously uh, have enough statistical power to study them. But it's a great question. And I think that one, one that bears uh, following. <clears throat> I love um, Tillman and Chris, you both sort of pushed the idea of looking at cumulative weather shocks. And I think this is fascinating. It's not something that I've considered so far. And I think it's a very interesting idea of trying to, in settings in which you have data that allow you to look at multiple shocks over time. Do those accumulate? Do they not accumulate? Um, at what point is a previous shock no longer affecting you versus still affecting you? How does it interact with an existing shock? I think these are important areas of inquiry and definitely um, I hope to see more work in this area. And I, and I hope to work on this uh, topic as well because um, I think that that would be a, an important policy question to understand. Should we think about a village that's already been affected by a flood in the past versus has not been affected um, differently. There's different reasons to think that there might be different impacts. Um, there could be a psychological impact on the affected village, but there could also be effects on their investments in insurance and the types of infrastructure they have. Maybe infrastructure has actually been destroyed in the past and, and they have less infrastructure now. Um, so the types of investments they've made in response and how those build resilience, yeah, or, or lack of resilience against future shocks, I think these are very uh, you know, interesting and open questions. So I, I hope to, to see more work on that and contribute to it. Um, 
So Tillman, you raised a really interesting question about um, should government be better at responding reactively to shocks or in building resilience so that shocks have lower impacts? And I think this is a very important question. I know in the donor community today, the idea of bringing long-term development principles to humanitarian responses is viewed as essential. Um, and I think it's especially important as the arrival rates of shocks is increasing. Um, there's also a, a growing focus on anticipatory action, um, trying to, to give people um, money or, or assets prior to the arrival of the shock to reduce its, its impact and trying to understand how anticipatory action and emergency responses, what impacts each of them has, what, when is one better than the other and on which dimensions. Um, uh, my, my work does not immediately speak to this, but I would love to, to, to push on this more. And I agree, it's a very important question. Um, Gary, you raised a really interesting question about you know, what positive income shocks do. And you'll have seen in the equations that I model this symmetrically, a continuous measure of, of, of extent of rainfall in, 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 in several of the papers. And we're sort of implicitly assuming from this, yeah, that, that a negative shock has an equal and opposite impact of a positive shock. So I, I do agree um, that it's, it's a good idea to consider potentially non-symmetric impacts of shocks. Um, we've done a little bit of this mostly in appendices in these papers, honestly, just to sort of see, is it extremes that are, that are driving this and what types of extremes? But I think this bears more consideration and is a very good point. Um, um, if you look at these two questions together, how do shock impacts accumulate over time and how do positive and negative shocks vary and and um, what what tipping points do you have for which a shock has truly negative impacts maybe non-linear i think these are important questions um finally chris you asked about the mental health impacts of shocks this is actually i did not have time to present it but i have a a paper um, in world development that is looking at the same data and it is looking at the mental health impacts um, of, of these negative shocks. And, and what we're finding is that um, what we were looking in this paper sort of actually to, to track, the, the paper is, is talking about shocks because we know they're occurring during this period, but we were really looking at the impacts of migration out of the, the village on mental health. And to the extent that shocks result in migration, this is relevant to the shocks question. Um, we find that migration definitely increases incomes, you know, large increases in incomes, but it actually results in declines in mental health. We see um, people less likely to be happy, more likely to be nervous and dissatisfied. And we see at the same time, rising aspirations that don't seem to be met. So individuals are um, moving away from origin villages. Maybe they're losing claims over assets at the origin and they're having increasing incomes, but rising aspirations that are actually rising more quickly than their incomes um, resulting in poor mental health outcomes. So I think there are some, some um, likely tying this into shocks that, you know, th there, there are some negative mental health impacts. Um, I, I've seen some other work on this question as well, and I, and I think it's an important one. Um, back to the room. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina. Um, Damir is an Aliyah, who I don't think needs much introduction, would like to uh, ask a question. Thank you, Katrina. Really rich set of um, findings. I was thinking about this income and shocks. Um, in these countries, um, household to household transfers, which kind of get invigorated and more activated after the shocks to, so households helping to those who struggled. So uh, what literature says about this, in what extent your research can see this intra, inter-household uh, help aid transfers um, and whether you see potential in your research in future. I know some information exists in Kyrgyz data. So I think that's something not only talking about government policies and what they can do, but 
effectively, I think household to household channel is probably most timely and efficient and very uh, targeted. That's what I would ask. Thank you, Damir. Do you want to respond directly, Katrina? Sure. So, thank you, Damir. I think this is important. It's an area of inquiry for me right now. Um, I have a, a paper um, just accepted to World Bank Economic Review that looks at the impacts of cash transfers on intra-household transfers and trust within the community. Um, and at least in this setting of Tanzania, we're finding um, there's a bit of a concern that you give cash transfers to poor households. And a lot of that spills over into non-poor households possibly because households that were giving money to poor households stop doing that. And you sort of have formal insurance um, destroying existing informal arrangements and social networks that can be really important to the poor, um, especially if formal social protection is, is not a permanent status for that individual. Um, so I think there is some degree of crowd out. Um, that is, of course, looking at cash transfers, which is a different type of shock. I, I motivate my talk in saying that cash transfers tell you about effects of increases in income on a particular demographic near the poverty line. Um, so I think there is a great idea to, you know, it's a great idea to look at intra-household transfers um, in response to shocks, um, uh, you know, finding data over a long period of time um, on this would be great. I'm betting that the Life in Kyrgyzstan study might be a really great source of information on this. And I would personally be, you know, interested to see how, how these um, inter, inter-household transfers are, are responding um, to shocks and, and how good these informal safety nets are. When do they work? When do they fail? Um, and what types of shocks, right? Shock, you know, when you have a, a shock that affects the entirety of a community versus an isolated shock affecting a particular household, you're likely to have a very different impact on those social networks. So um, I, I, I agree, this is an important area of inquiry. Thank you. I also um, thought it was very interesting that you um, talk brought out the idea that shocks can lock you into your location. Yeah, we talk a lot about migration and either household migration, you know, the entire household relocating. Um, in my work, it's a lot because of war, for example, and conflict. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, of course, often it's more individual migration that the household stays where it is, but individual members, often men, migrate um, domestically or internationally. But um, I thought it was nice the way you brought out that sometimes um, people are sort of forced to stay um or you know maybe the men are forced to stay also to you know repair house or to you know protect their assets or to yeah so that um it actually a shock can reduce the number of options that you have in order to cope where maybe without the shock you would have just done regular um migration as a way of earning money building up assets and in a sort of positive way yeah not as a defensive strategy so i thought that was another one i don't know if you had any further uh, reflections on that um across the papers yeah, no, it's an interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon, the idea of a shock retaining people. And, and when shocks also, um, when they tend to um, result in, in security declines, I mean, particular types of shock where shocks where there's security considerations and, um, you know, women may be more vulnerable when there's uh, declines in security and, and maybe, you know, less ability to, to leave them behind. If, if more men are migrating away, maybe um, there's less of a, you know, protective aspect in, in the family, in the community. And so sort of understanding how these, these dynamics materialize across a family, across a, a community, I think is, I think is interesting. Um, I think more work is to be done on different types of shocks and how different types of shocks contribute to um, retaining or, or creating opportunities further away for, for people. I, I do agree this is very important in understanding the, the normative factors, the resource-related factors that moderate impacts is, is critical. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any final comments or observations from the floor um, which you would like to raise? Then we know. And um, then thank you very much. We're now um, coming close to our tea break. I'm very sorry you can't join us. Um, a cup of tea together, Katrina, but we'll catch up on that. I think you are going to continue working on Kyrgyzstan, I hope, yeah, so that we can welcome you to future 
um, Life in Kyrgyzstan conferences, and perhaps this is a good moment to uh, announce that uh, we will have, of course, another Life in Kyrgyzstan conference coming up next year. And just so I don't make any mistakes, I'm scrolling to my calendar uh, to next year, um, October. And I think we will have it next year on the 11th and the 12th of October. So please do pencil that in, Katrina, so we can perhaps have you then here or anybody else who would like to join us again next year. We'll also announce that um, online on social media shortly. Um, it's always fantastic to hear about people working on Kyrgyzstan and other countries um, in the region or elsewhere, um, learning from your research, for example, Katrina, on all these different issues, on gender, on shocks, on migration, on coping, on resilience, on aspirations. These are fascinating and important concepts and important lessons that we derive from that, and it stimulates us and it gives us ideas. And uh, I hope it uh, raises our aspirations, yeah, so that we... Uh, uh, academia is full of negative shocks as well, but so we can persist and uh, build our resilience, yeah, as as the academic community and helping policymakers and practitioners do more um, evidence-based uh, policymaking and learning from the programs that they implement and helping them do better to support uh, human development uh, here in Kyrgyzstan and, and in Central Asia and beyond, yeah. So thank you for helping us on the way with your great keynote speech, uh, Katrina. Have uh, safe travels. Um, in Kenya and beyond, and uh, uh, maybe you can all join me in uh, giving one more round of applause uh, to our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tillman, Damir, and everyone. I appreciate it. Wishing you a good conference, and I wish I could be there, uh, but greetings from Nairobi, and uh, please do take care. Enjoy your coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.